All right, thank you, everyone. We're back on Tuesday afternoon. I'm just going to pick up on a conversation on H96. Pretty, um, but first, I, I just I did get an email from um, Katie McClain that said that she is available at 10 after 4 for us. And I'm just going to check my phone here to see if who else got that. Um, so Kira, can you post that? Okay, so on online is um, is the new draft of eight of two forty four. I suspect with that one change on it, but we can look at it at ten after four. Uh, Representative Tango, I know you'll be in another committee. Um, we can hold the vote open for you. I don't want to take a vote in, in advance for you. Um, so thank you all for the conversation on 329. That's what um, we'll have. I did reach out to Maxine Representative Graff and ask Ron to set up a time to meet with them, looks like on Thursday. So um, that still works for us. We just have to make sure Damien's available. What's much <coughs> time on, on uh, this week? So H96 is also on our list of um, priorities. I also shared, um, based on the notes that I have from our previous conversations and also from the document that I shared with you from the International Center of Truth of Transitional Justice, um, the comments that were made by our friends down there. And so Damien is working on a new draft that he'll provide for us before tomorrow's meeting. That um, again, I'll take responsibility for listening to um, the comments that we've heard thus far, and also with the notion of pulling back a little bit just to say, um, what is it we're trying to create, how are we trying to get there and how we're, you know, it's the same question we've been working on with the bill. And um, so I just wanted to open the floor to conversation on 96 to see what people thought about the comments that were made by ICTJ or anything that you contemplated during the break on it and just kind of take today as a as kind of a preview we're pretty much going to be doing all 96 for the next two days to see if we can finish it um, and so i just wanted to take today as kind of a as a as a preview for the next two days um, representative Hango. um i read the memo from the ICTJ and I I do have a lot of the same um, concerns about the size of the stakeholder group even though I have advocated to have as many voices different voices as possible um, to reflect the eugenics apology um, and also um, that the sheer breadth of this bill it's not specifically about one particular wrong. Like for instance, the Maryland Truth Commission is specifically about one issue, which was lynching. Um, and the Canadian one was specifically targeted for one, typical, one type of population, which was indigenous peoples. So I feel like this is, it's really broad. Um, and big. Um, broad isn't necessarily bad in my mind, but big, uh, big in scope, in vision, and in sheer numbers of people, and also in um, the amount of funding that it's going to take. So those are just some thoughts, but I was pleased to see this group of experts, global experts, also raise some of the same concerns that I have.
Well, I guess I've left everybody speechless. <laughs> Excellently stated, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> I think when I reread the document, I hadn't looked at it. I printed it out before we left, and I didn't. Um, I wanted to stay married, so I didn't <laughs> open it up while I was on vacation. Um, yeah, it was great. Dinner was great. Um, <laughs> had I opened up this document, I, I, I think I would have gone, you know, very far away into the river. <laughs> I'd be just arriving at the St. Lawrence. Um, and I think it was surprising to me what, between that and the, and the comments. First, the comments, because the comments were like, oh my God, this is so broad. Oh my God, the, the, the stakeholders are you know, in, this, in the selection panel. And, and I kept thinking, that's not what we've been talking about. But there it was in version 3.1 was saying, you know, that, that the stakeholder group and the selection panel would have, I think, an oversight over the commissioners that I wasn't intending in my thinking. And I hadn't been thinking of it in that way. So the conversation was always based on they would peel off or they would peel off and and, and the commissioners would be the ones who were um, running it as autonomously and independently as possible. With the input, the inclusion comes in with whatever groups, whatever commissions get formed that obviously the commissioners would be working with each of the interested stakeholder groups. And so, um, when I did see that, I again counted my blessings that I didn't open up the bill and I was gone. Um, but for the last 24 hours or so, just working on it again, shared with Damien just like some of these comments that were made here to go through the bill and just to try to streamline it back again. And I, I think details we'll talk about tomorrow. But um, I'm just so grateful that <coughs> ICTJ is following us and is <laughs> providing us with this kind of guidance because it's really, it's really been helpful. Are they going to be around again tomorrow, like on Zoom available? If um, I, I, I don't know that they've been invited. I just, you know, I did, I, did they always at least watch on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And we can make sure that they have the Zoom link for our work again. Um, and again, I think Ron has changed the agenda so you can see it on the computer. So it's it's pretty much um, all 96 tomorrow. I had to check in with Matt on bumping the alcohol bills down, down the week a little bit. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> I hope we're on the same page on that now. Yeah. So, and again, the theory behind the alcohol bills is to get something. We talked a lot about some of the bills, some of the pieces, but we want to get more than a technical correction bill out with the assumption that it's going to come back to us because the, mm -hmm. the Senate will add something, right. but they won't. They won't. Um, rubber stamp our work, especially now. there's so many pieces that we know that we have to deal with on the alcohol bill, but we'll have more time this week. Yeah, Representative Murphy. Well, I just want to share that I did take some of this committee's work with me on my holiday and in Maryland, in one of the public libraries that my grandchildren and I went into, there was a glass case exhibit in the entranceway of the um, committee, the committee uh, collecting Soils. There were large jars with soil that was from areas where lynchings had been. Um, there was a description of the project. I was looking for my pictures because there are a few pictures my, I had my daughter take, but I can't find them. But I just, I thought it was, for me, it was a connection to what we're doing here. And it was a tangible of, of what we could see as an outcome, agreeing with Lisa that if there was some 
specific we were looking at, and maybe it happens after this next, but as a goal where there's something out in the public domain that people really can connect to emotionally and, and, and with understanding that this was part of history. And, and, and I think that's been a successful piece of yeah. the reconciliation commission outcomes of, um, I was up in Quebec City and yep. went to the Museum of Civilization, which I didn't get to four years ago because our, our town meeting break coincides with school break <laughs> in Quebec. And so four years ago when we went, it was impossible to get in. Um, and for probably COVID reasons, we could get in this time. And so in the Museum of Civilization, they had a dedicated space for their indigenous and Inuit populations. That was um, really well done. And it's part of, I don't know if celebration is the right word, but commemoration. And, yeah. and, and, and it was written in their language. Like we did this and this happened with us. But so much, you know, so much art, so much, um, so many words, including a section that included um, the recent the 2021 conversations about the findings of the of the bodies at the, yeah. at the schools, and it really was um, again given the context of our work, it was really kind of powerful. But it was an example too of where can this go? You know, I don't think we can say in our, we can't say in our legislation that this is what the commissioners right. and, and everybody and, and, the, and the stakeholders will determine. No. And so this is part of the pulling back and saying, well, it's, we know that a commemoration is necessary. We know perhaps that some kind of, is it a museum? Is it a series of public concerts or public, you know, whatever, whatever the outcome is at the end of this process, um, it, it should cap all of the work that went into it. And in Canada right now, it's this museum in Quebec and it's just, um, you know, it's, it's crazy good. And, um, very powerful stuff. Um, listening, listening to somebody there in the video of someone um, being interviewed from. He was in the back of their back of a pickup truck, and he's driving through their neighborhood that the government had given them was all rent houses. Totally, you know, normal to us neighborhood. And he was just talking about how this is just so. It feels like jail. Yeah, because of the connection to the their, his <clears throat> to the to the wilderness and the outside of this that that he can no longer participate in, and um, I don't think it would have been as powerful to me if we weren't in this context right now. John, uh, I've become increasingly more comfortable with the openness of it at the beginning because I, I feel like if. Um, in, in the, the like four years that I've served here, I've learned like, so much about perspectives and histories and experiences. <clears throat> and um, with a lot of the framing and even the bills that are on our walls dealing with kind of systemic harm, national data is brought in. And I think what's really missing is for us in Vermont to understand the harm in Vermont that's happened to our different populations. And I think this is an opportunity here to really be Vermont specific about issues and have the, as, 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 as the filter was going, it was community input, um, both about what are the harms we should investigate. And then with the commissioners, it's like, what are the steps that are needed? It's not saying we're gonna do this and we have, and conceptually anyway, these three commissioners, and we have conceptually chosen three different communities, right? Those communities may choose other than the three that we chose, the BIPOC community, the disabled community, right? 
And so I, I think in terms of kind of self-determination of community voices, I think this is a great process. And I think it's one that can work in Vermont because we cannot take um, only national um, data on kind of systemic racism in banking or in anything, unless we really investigate it in Vermont. And then we can say, what do we owe Vermont in this process? So I, you know, we don't have a single incident that we're trying to redress, um, but I think this is a great way to understand if there are issues to redress, you know, and, and, and what those issues are and what those communities are. So I, I um, I'm very comfortable with the openness of it. And I, I've gotten to like it more and more. Uh, I went to <clears throat> the other big city in Canada, um, Montreal, with my partner. <laughs> Um, for a couple of days and went to a really good museum for that if you haven't been there before the McCord Museum um, and it's a <clears throat> it's a cultural museum and there's a very um, um, I, it's not extensive but it's a, um, a really interesting <laughs> and diverse um, exhibit on indigenous culture in Canada and um, and a fair amount of it went into, um, you know, the um, the work of, of truth and reconciliation. And there was <clears throat> one um, there was one paragraph that stuck out for me in in you know reading these different um, panels. And <clears throat> I just thought I'd share it with you. Is the reason so many Indigenous voices have been raised against the idea of reconciliation is that it must necessarily be preceded by healing. Imagining that reconciliation is possible without change is too easy. There are actions that must be taken before a true encounter between the different populations occupying this territory can take place. And that, you know, and and it and I and I we may use the word reconciliation in you know as a kind of um long-term goal. Um, but I think that the truth part is, um, you know, is key to that healing. Um, and, and, you know, there were several people who talked about, you know, something that this committee has certainly heard about language, how language and it, and, and its absence, you know, um, how many, how many different languages were lost um, <clears throat> in Indigenous cultures in Canada and, and that, you know, um, one of the first steps some of the folks were arguing is, you know, that you need to make it a little bit of an attempt um, <clears throat> to understand that there are these languages um, and, um, and that that's, we communicate and we find languages to do that. And um, anyway, I, I'm sorry, I'm going on. It, it just was a, it, it, it was, um, I couldn't get away from H96 when I went on vacation. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. yep. <clears throat> well, I'd like to add a little something. Um, I was really struck by the, uh, by the email we got from the Truth and Justice group and thinking, oh my God, you know, does this mean we've got to scrap big sections of the sending start all over again? But no, I don't think so. I think we have to look at the details. I was also a little bit disheartened, frankly, at the end of the week before we went on break and we heard testimony that sounded like, you guys are going way too far. You're supposed, you're supposed to be dealing only with the, um, the people of, who are affected by the eugenics project. And no, we're talking about history that happened long before the eugenics project. And I totally reject that message which seemed to be coming uh, from a couple of people. Uh, so I think we do have to remain broad 
but I, I do think we do have to, we might have to look at the original set of stakeholders. You know, is it up to 37? I don't know what the total is anymore. Uh, but we have to make sure that we have sufficient uh, representation of the affected populations, but you know, does it mean that the group has to be that big? It, it can't become unwieldy, clearly. Right. So I'm, I'm ready to charge ahead on this. <clears throat> We're going to have a couple of hard days ahead of us. I think it's. Better bring snacks. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Should we be bringing in? I'll bring some in. Cookies with espresso beans instead of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara, I think I share if you can, just like, I mean, because you had a context. Like when you saw the display, you were like, yeah, the one degree of Barbara separation. Right? <laughs> I know all about this. It was. I, yes, I told my daughter, and she said she had actually seen that we had it because she peeks at our work sometimes. And I did find my photographs, and one that um, I can pass around is. I don't know who can see it, so we'll just send it. But it's three jars. One's from Poolsville, two are from Rockville, and it's soil from the area where these lynchings were. They and and then the, the sign. Yeah, read the sign because the, the sign is from Brian Stevenson, who is um, he's the director of the Equal Justice Institute. He was uh, the movie that uh, Just Mercy. Um, <clears throat> Jordan was. So he's an attorney in Montgomery, I believe. Who serves people on death row for only commit. Yeah. I think that that's his life's work, yeah. And he- um, He's quoted. He wrote, he's reconciliation with a difficult past cannot be achieved without truthfully confronting history and finding a way forward that is thoughtful and responsible. And I thought in conjunction with you, what you said, John, that, that really looking at Vermont and, and what occurred here and-, right. and you know that that's the piece that brings it to a focus as, as lisa was saying having a somehow pulling a focus and obviously that's still a very broad focus maybe that needs to be further but but that it is that vermont what did what did vermont do or not do what did we permit to happen and so there's other but that was the only one i downloaded um but it was, it was two glass case, you know, you walk in a library and you got those cases and they had done this display. And I think they're doing them in all of the um, county library, all the libraries that. And is it one of um, um, batch of soil per lynching? Yes. And it has the person's name on it and the date of the lynching. Uh -huh. No, it's, and obviously it's current day soil. So, right. But, but it is that, and, and they also collected and sent to, there's a display where I think all of them are for the whole project. And so, cause these three, they're, they're where they were, they're in the communities where they were or like near to it. <clears throat> so I think that there's also a, a collection somewhere of all of the lynchings and they had similar jars that had been sent for that. So simplistic in a way, but it, very moving and very connected. So I think that's part of my issue with the broadness of this. First of all, I really did think, Tommy, that we were going to be addressing the eugenics apology with this legislation. Um, so I guess I was mistaken from the get-go. And with respect to the broadness of all of this, um, just went sideways. It's okay. Look I back. I feel like we need to identify what we're trying to solve, what we're trying to make better, not what we're trying to solve, but what we're trying to make better, what harm that's happened that we are trying to make better by this, by establishing this Truth and Reconciliation Committee. Because I think you need to know the harm before you convene a committee to study the effects of whatever that misdeed was or misdeeds. And I don't feel like we have identified that. 
That's a, it's an interesting point. I mean, I think we don't know. But that's the point is that we don't know the harm. We know that people feel that harm was committed. We know that I was when I was visiting with Damien today, there's a picture we gave him to commemorate when we rewrote the alcohol laws. And the book was from the 20s or maybe the 30s. It was just a Xerox of that page. And his comment was along the lines of, you know, the things that you see when you go back and look in old statute, you know, that is the system that we lived in, the things that we did, that we put down on paper. Um, I, I think the goal of this is to not know at first what the harm is. We need to have the, the folks feel like they can tell us and literally really again. I mean, we heard a limited number regarding eugenics, but in terms of the larger history or the larger feelings um, of feelings of discrimination of othering, um, that's what that's what this is. This is trying not to prescribe what the end game is supposed to be. And that we're not used to that as legislators. We're used to having we want we want to do legislation that has a definitive outcome. And I'm not sure this is in that category. That's just my personal thoughts on it. Well, you know, it, yeah, it's like we're trying to create a container, right? That is safe and supported within which <clears throat> people can do this work as they essentially define it. Um, and the, the, the scary thing I think for a legislature is that it's iterative. <clears throat> um, it will have its own kind of, you know, hopefully it will learn as it goes along um, uh, things that will somewhat shift direction um, or <clears throat> require more, um, I guess I just, I, I haven't ever thought about this in legislature, le, a legislator's terms in that, like, it, you know, I'm comfortable <clears throat> when I was running a nonprofit, allowing things to be iterative. We had strategic goals and all that, but, but, <clears throat> But here we like to we like to to nail everything down, you know, and we, we like to be able to anticipate every situation, <laughs> and <clears throat> and I think that this kind of a process just it it defies that, or or if you if you stick to a we will make a great mistake I think if we try to spell everything out, you know, um, it's it's not really fully ours to spell out. We, it is ours to support and provide a, um, <clears throat> and establish an interest in. But anyway, it's, it's unusual. It is, it is different um, just in response to you, Representative Hangman. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so that's, that's my biggest problem is I like concrete, I deal in concrete. Um, so it is really hard for me to have a big, broad, open-ended piece of legislation to write because, I mean, yes, we have identified certain harms that have been done, but we're not targeting those harms. And I think that's where I've gone off the rails with this, um, just because it's too open-ended for me. It's too broad. I can't, I, d I don't know how to write that type of legislation. So that's, that's me. 
And I'm sorry, I'm going to leave to defend our other bill. Bring our bill home. <laughs> right. We're all there. We have faith in you. Be back. And if I'm not back in a reasonable amount of time, do you want to take the vote without me on 244? No, we'll keep it open. Okay, so, so uh, we'll just come, come back. back here and, okay. and uh, okay. I won't. I can I can send Kara down to like poke her head in and then just go. Hey, no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll we'll see you when we see you. I'll be here. Okay. Go get him, Lisa. Go get him. Uh, Representative Trump. So one of the things that I recall from uh, I see TJ and from Chief Joseph and uh, his daughter were consistent message that. You need to identify that harm was done. I think we've done that. I think we've done that in a big way. I think the time we spent researching um, eugenics apology last year was just a total eye opener, or it should have been to everyone on the committee, as far as that we um, that the state of Vermont had done such a, a dastardly deed. But um, I think to extend uh, uh, on what. The chair said, I think that we need to be told what that harm was. Because as outsiders, we cannot identify what happens. I mean, the, 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 the piece that I remember is Chief, uh, is uh, Don Stevens coming in and talking about an elderly woman in his community that still won't leave her house at 90 years old. I mean, how is that? What, how can you live that way? And the reason she did it is because she was in fear that someone would come and do something to her. Now that fear is just unimaginable to all of us. And it's it, it, so we need to be told, we need to be told these stories. We need to be told how this has impacted the lives of the people. Uh, and that being said, yeah, I do think that the stake, the number of stakeholders is unwieldy. Um, you know, I've spoken numerous times uh, in this um, in this body about um, study committees and uh, and various committees that are just too large so um, you know I think a little work should be done on that as far as seeing if we can whittle it down um, and 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 going to the fears that or the concerns that uh, I see TJ had as far as um, um, keeping uh, or, or the stakeholders being in some sort of some position of power over the committee uh, and uh, the possibility of uh, intimidation and uh, and steering things uh, within the committee um, is probably not a, a fair way to go as far as I can see. My memory too of the interview that we had with Chief Joseph's daughter, Karen. As well, just the idea of um, you know her admonition to us, you know, just just acknowledging, you know, to represent Hango's point, it, it's not comfortable. Yeah. Susan Aronoff, when she said her vision would be to have county by county or section by section. Hearings is where all past and present legislators would sit and listen, which is possible. Mm -hmm. right? it, it, it could be possible to have that under this structure, is what I see. But um, it's just, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. I just was going to say, um, I, I what what Chip Representative Triana said about you know we we heard the harm in conjunction with the eugenics work we did and I think that's the piece that Lisa was putting on the table that that's the connection we had and again back to John that, that Representative Kalaki that that that's the harm that's the point of the Vermont piece that we've seen not to say that's the only harm Vermont has done or or you know piece but that was kind of the focal piece. And I think that's where this is trying to do so much more and for good or bad, I'm not saying, but but that's the difference. Like you were saying, this is a natural, well, it is, but again, you tied it to the eugenics work we did right. and, and that harm point. And that's very different 
from what this has become. This is much bigger than that. Well, it's, it expands on it to a point where we learned so much more during that eugenics apology as to the expanse of what the, the, these things were in Vermont. I mean, we didn't expand on it. They were expanded as far as um, taking children out of the home because it was determined that the, it was an unsanitary condition and putting them in Brandon training school. You know, it's I, we heard from people to, who were in Brandon training. To the eugenics moment though. That's still the 1930, right. Right. 1920. Right. And, and that's what I'm saying, that that's narrower than what this is. Well, I mean, we heard about apartheid. I mean, how, how broad was that in, but, in trying to reconcile apartheid? Right, but that's... That's not the moment. <laughs> well, it's not. It's South Africa, but it certainly has an impact on what you know. I heard from ICTJ. Of course, of course. I mean, that's the work they do is is so much broader. But when we're looking at our piece, I mean, again, going back to the Maryland, where it was a very specific action, not even really, you know, it was very true. narrow. And they were they in some ways it was concerned that it was too narrow, that it didn't allow. And so I think there is a. Oh, but we also heard from the Maine Commission right. that said we started with the, the schools. Right. And it went this way. Right. You know, and so again, we're all unique yeah, in some yeah. way, shape, or form. Um, to uh, represent the Blue Leader. Well, yeah, I was just going to say, you know, I, in, in many of the discussions we've had, I mean, why were these groups of people a focus of eugenics? Because we thought of these groups of people as lesser human beings. And that has, and that has a history. And <clears throat> you, we could isolate <clears throat> eugenics, but many of the indigenous people who have talked to us have also talked about, you know, <clears throat> their connection to the land and what it has meant for, <clears throat> for them not to have that same connection. And it's not just about ownership, it's, it's about like the, the, this Western notion of ownership, right? Um, and, and stewardship. So, so I don't know how you talk about something <clears throat> about, a, I think that it ends up being a broader discussion because it has deep roots. Um, and and I, <clears throat> I guess we would have to trust the commissioners and the committees to decide just how <clears throat> broad and deep to go. Right, because we're the engineers, like we're creating the tool creating the process of all of this stuff that we want that we think that we should hear about we're not going to be privy to that at first that's that's the work of the commissioners right it's our i mean representative Lubin and i were on a short phone call with ictj yesterday and one of the comments that they made was that it felt like we were already starting the commission's work by allowing the conversations that we were hearing from, and they mentioned Susan in particular, just about her thoughts about how it should be handled. And, and that's different than what we're trying to do, which is to create the process where that can happen. And that's, um, again, it's a little, it is a little scary. You know, I don't think it's not scary. Um, I worry more about how do we how do we get people to listen to what we're trying to do mm -hmm. and the reasons why we're trying to do it. Um, what stood out about the lynching conversation last week was that the last known lynching in Maryland was 1933. You're know, like, mm -hmm. well, in the time frame, you know, we passed the bill in 1931. Yeah. How, you know, about it, about um, Eugenics. So the time thing is really interesting. I mean, mm -hmm. the broadness of it is 
and I can make conjecture about what people are going to find. Record keeping in Vermont was pretty pathetic between 1793 and <clears throat> whatever, you know, and but, um, <laughs> but just interesting to see um, mm -hmm. how that. Yeah, we're, 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 we are doing something that we haven't really done before. So, Representative Klacki. Well, uh, I, we, ha we certainly did learn, I did learn a lot. <laughs> but I think there's so much more to learn in different communities. And uh, like all of us, we exist in many communities. But um, three years ago, when we had Disability Awareness Day here, people in wheelchairs were told they couldn't come into the well of the house. It was like, well, how can we have a Disability Awareness Day? Not <laughs> people who were told literally to be outside in the hall. And it was like, no, no, this, this can't be. And, you know, just because people didn't know here, right? They didn't know. So I had to scramble around, talk to different people, and of course people were invited in. But can you imagine coming here oh. just be wearing a state in a wheelchair and be told to sit in the hall? This happened two years ago, pre-COVID. Okay. And I now sit on the prevention discrimination prevention panel. And so one thing we did, we just invited people who work in the disability world to come and say, just give us your perceptions of what it's like to come into the state house. And they said, it's not our house. You all call it the people's house. How can we come in? And when we come in, we're told we can only have five minutes. And if you're in a wheelchair, a wheelchair could not get in this room. So, so if we really mean this, we'd have to go to a different room. To invite people in okay and you know we heard today that we're going to address this subtitling thing it, it's like you're on acid reading those lines of what we're saying it's <laughs> incomprehensible and people have been bragging about how transparent we are and how much more open we are and it's like to who and on thursday last week I went and asked for an ADA accommodation for Friday because there was going to be five inches of snow and I couldn't take my roller through the five inches of snow. And I said, no, it's not part of the resolution. So I sat there on Friday. Um, I wanted to be, I had never missed a vote. I did not vote on Friday, but I sat on the screen. And every time someone said, it's so great to be in the people's house. I remembered someone saying, whose people's house are we talking about? I am sitting here not able to vote because I can't walk through five inches of snow. And so I think it's essential that the openness of this, because we're all not dissimilar. We're all pretty similar. And even with our disparate life experiences, there's a certain thing here and we're not reality. We're not the lived experiences of all these people, especially people who are invisible, who are marginalized, who've never given a voice. And so I think this process allows us to build from eugenics and hear about systemic harms. And you know, in a 96% white universe, it's hard to understand systemic racism. And so we have to understand it, but not from our perspective. We have to understand it from the impact of community. So, um, you know, I, I think, you know, this institution, has to learn a lot about disability as I'm learning every day myself. But it's like, so this is going to benefit all of us. And this cannot be a top down thing that all of us understand because the people house is a construct for us, not for the communities that we don't let in here. So, you know, I, I just think that this process I really like. And we're going to learn things that we don't already know. So I have, you know, I'm more like a border collie. I want to get things right <laughs> focused, but um, I think it's been great that this has taken this much time. But it, we have to learn from those, not us.
I personally was not aware of all the uh, difficulties uh, people with disabilities had until uh, my husband had to use a wheelchair. And then you realize the sidewalks, uh, trying to find a way to get into a building, take them to the bathroom where there wasn't a, you know, <laughs> it's like, okay, <laughs> and then it was like, you know what, we're going in the ladies room because they are certainly more tolerable and, you know, not like, oh, oh, oh. it's like, and have to have somebody posted outside the door saying, oh, my mother's in, in there with my dad. It's like, so I, you know, unless you live it, unless you are in it, you don't, you just, you know, you just don't realize. Well, in any community, I mean, that's, yeah. True, true. Yeah. In the disability community, we say that those of you are temporarily abled. Because <laughs> 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 disability hits us all when we age. Or, you know, <laughs> sadly, so that's the standard line. So what are you looking for, Tom? <laughs> yes. <clears throat> what do you hope that we do next year? Do next on the bill? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> I guess that's sort of what I had that too. It's like what what is building it now? It looks so like tomorrow, new suggestions. So tomorrow, um, Damien, he's there listening. Not that we're talking about specific policy changes, but again, I shared my thoughts on what I heard. Bring, bring the next version forward that addresses some of the concerns raised in the ICC today, um, including the including the stakeholder issue. It's not we're not done, but um, tomorrow is going to be we're going to review the draft, and we're just going to put our heads down and engineer do the best we can to like make sure that everything that we've talked about for the last two months on this bill that we kind of put our blinders on and say what do we think works best it's not there's going to be questions there's going to be arguments there's going to be pressure to get it done by you know certain <clears> time. <throat> um we should all be well hydrated <laughs> and uh you know make sure we have take our breaks because we've been working on this all day or all morning and then after lunch. And so um, <clears throat> we can keep it in the spirit of, again, I appreciate that there are gonna be differences on this. Um, I also appreciate it's not comfortable to think <clears throat> about doing something that has an to do work. <laughs> but we're gonna start tomorrow morning and work our way through the bill and see what Amy and I put together, which isn't too terribly different from, there are some radical changes in terms of the beginning of the bill, in terms of trying to deal with, based on some of the stuff that ICTJ recommended and some questions that still have to be answered. But um, I, you know, working with Damien, I just gave him my pile of notes and said, here you go. And, see what he shows up with. And so we're talking tomorrow the 3.1? I believe it'll be 4.1. Okay. So or 3.2. Or 3. <laughs> it's more than a 3.2. It could be a 5.1. <laughs> it, it'll be a 4.1. It'll, it'll be a 4.1. 4.1. Okay. Because I'm, I'm in documents and handouts right now. And the most current one yeah. we have is a 3.1. Yeah, I started doing some work when I finally did open my computer on 2.1. And I'm going, God, I thought we changed this already. <laughs> and we did. Yeah. Yeah, 3.1 yeah. is what I responded to. Yeah. So. Um, all right, 
let's um, finish with 96 now. <coughs> Thank you, everybody. That was a that was a good conversation. I appreciate you taking the time to just sort of.